Hello, my name is Dr. Kimberly Cheatham. Welcome to this video presentation over what do I do with this patient who is bleeding with a positive pregnancy test? Today's objective is to discuss the differential diagnosis, evaluation, and management of a female patient presenting with vaginal bleeding and a positive pregnancy test. The presentation of a reproductive age female to the clinic or emergency department with vaginal bleeding and a positive pregnancy test is common. Because of the potential life-threatening causes for this presentation, it is very important for the learner to be prepared. An appropriate differential diagnosis is listed here. Most vaginal bleeding associated with a positive pregnancy test will be related to the pregnancy. However, this is not always true. There are a number of different terms for a possible miscarriage or a miscarriage in progress. You should be familiar with all of them. Consistent with most of medical practice, the appropriate process for evaluating a patient begins with a history and physical examination. For women in early pregnancy with bleeding, the workup should also include a quantitative beta HCG, also known as a beta quant, a transvaginal ultrasound, and don't forget to check a CBC and the patient's blood type and RH. There are several types of HCG tests that can be ordered. One is a qualitative HCG that will give you a result of positive, meaning yes, there is HCG in the patient's blood, or negative, meaning no, there's not HCG in the patient's blood. This qualitative test is not helpful for evaluating the patient with bleeding in early pregnancy. The test that should be ordered for bleeding in early pregnancy is a quantitative HCG because it actually provides a number that reflects how much HCG is in the patient's blood. This number roughly correlates with the age of the pregnancy and should approximately double every 48 to 72 hours for the first six to eight weeks. Once the quantitative beta HCG number reaches 1500 or higher, we expect to see evidence of a pregnancy inside the uterus on transvaginal ultrasound. If we do not see anything in the uterus with an HCG of 1500 or higher, the pregnancy is most likely abnormal. The quantitative beta HCG number of 1500 milli international units per ml is referred to as the discriminatory zone because it discriminates between when we should see something in the uterus above 1500 and when we will not below 1500. This number 1500 is a rough estimate. Here is a sagittal view of the uterus with an early gestational sac. There is a faint circle present in the black sac. This faint circle is called the yolk sac and is the first identifiable part of a normal pregnancy after the gestational sac appears. Miscarriages, also called spontaneous abortions, are very common and present with bleeding in early pregnancy. You should be able to differentiate between the various types of abortions so that you manage them appropriately. A threatened abortion is a pregnancy that may still be viable or one that can survive. We watch and wait with no intervention because nothing has been proven to improve the fetus's chance for survival. A missed abortion can be managed by watching and waiting for the patient to miscarry on her own and avoid the risk of surgery, or it can be managed by a dilation and curatage known as a D and C in the operating room. This is a procedure that cleans out the non-viable pregnancy tissue. Inevitable or incomplete abortions are associated with an open cervix and often involve significant bleeding. A septic abortion is one that is infected and can also have significant bleeding. All of these should be managed in the operating room with a D and C to minimize risk to the mother. Intravenous antibiotics will also be required for treatment of a septic abortion. Although miscarriages are common and usually self-limited, there can be complications. These can include excessive bleeding, leading to the need for blood transfusion or surgery, infection, incomplete passage or removal of tissue, and RH negative patients. Patients with a negative blood type will need to receive Rogam after any bleeding associated with a pregnancy. Miscarriages can be very difficult for patients. The initial reaction may be anger or denial, and the patient may leave your office quickly without asking questions after receiving the bad news. You need to reach out to these patients and offer them compassion. When they're ready to discuss options for management, you need to make time for them in your busy schedule. Be sure to schedule a follow-up visit at about four weeks post-miscarriage. 
you'll want to perform an examination to ensure that the uterus is involuting to its original pre-pregnancy size. You should also discuss future pregnancy plans and contraception with the patient. Most miscarriages do not affect a patient's chances for pregnancy in the future. A more worrisome non-viable pregnancy is an ectopic. An ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that implants outside the normal location of the endometrial cavity. This cartoon illustrates the many locations where an ectopic pregnancy can implant. The most common location is in the ampullary region of the fallopian tube. You will see ectopic pregnancies as a clinician because they constitute about 2% of all pregnancies. They are life-threatening and are the leading cause of maternal mortality in the first trimester. If you're working in the ER, an ectopic pregnancy should be at the top of your differential diagnosis for a patient with bleeding in an early pregnancy. If you diagnose the ectopic pregnancy early enough, you can save her future childbearing capabilities and her life. The evaluation of each patient with bleeding in a positive pregnancy test includes a history and physical exam, a quantitative beta HCG, and a transvaginal ultrasound. As you're taking the history, you should inquire about risk factors for an ectopic pregnancy. Some of the risk factors are listed here. Other important questions to ask during the history relate to menstrual history, current bleeding, pain, and syncope or fainting. The physical examination actually starts when you first look at the patient as you walk in the room. Does the patient look pale? Is she bent over in pain? Or is she smiling and chatting happily with a friend? These can be clues to how urgent the situation is. The physical exam should include orthostatic vital signs. You should evaluate the abdomen for tenderness, rebound, and guarding. The pelvic exam includes looking at how much blood is present on the vulva, in the vagina, and even on the floor. Is the cervical os open? Do you see any tissue? On bimanual exam, is she tender? Do you feel an adnexal mass? Be gentle so you don't rupture an ectopic pregnancy if one is present. The next steps occur simultaneously, getting a quantitative beta HCG and obtaining a transvaginal ultrasound or transabdominal if a transvaginal ultrasound is not available to you. The discriminatory zone for transvaginal ultrasound is 1500, but the discriminatory zone for transabdominal ultrasound is much higher, at about 6500, because it's harder to see pregnancy through the abdominal wall. You will detect an ectopic pregnancy, or any pregnancy, earlier by using transvaginal ultrasound. You will interpret the history, physical exam, HCG level, and ultrasound findings together. In a patient with an HCG greater than 1500, you should see evidence of a pregnancy in the uterus. If you do not, she most likely has miscarried or has an ectopic. If the HCG is lower than 1500, you should not see any evidence of pregnancy in the uterus because it's too early. In this case, if the patient is hemodynamically stable and not in much pain, you should order serial quantitative beta HCGs every 48 hours until you reach the discriminatory zone then repeat the ultrasound. However, ectopic pregnancies may not ever reach an HCG level of 1500, but you may still see evidence of an ectopic on ultrasound as a complex multi-part cyst or mass in the adnexa. If the transvaginal ultrasound demonstrates a suspicious adnexal mass, even if the HCG level is below the discriminatory zone, the diagnosis is highly likely to be an ectopic. Here are two transvaginal images of the uterus. The image on your left shows an empty uterus with no evidence of a pregnancy. The endometrial stripe is thin and easily seen. The image on your right shows a small intrauterine gestational sac with a faint yolk sac. When you see this, you have essentially ruled out an ectopic pregnancy. Here is another sagittal image of the uterus, but it looks different because there's a lot of black behind the uterus. Remember that black represents fluid. In a patient with a history of vaginal bleeding and a positive pregnancy test, I would be very worried that this image represents a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Once you've diagnosed an ectopic pregnancy, you have two treatment options. Do not treat unless you're 100% positive that the patient has an ectopic. Consult an OBGYN if there's any doubt. One management method is an injectable medication called methotrexate. The other management option is surgery. Methotrexate is a folic acid antagonist that acts on rapidly dividing cells, such as those of a developing embryo. 
It is important that you are familiar with which patients are good candidates for methotrexate treatment and which ones should have surgery. Only patients who are hemodynamically stable with no evidence of rupture, a small ectopic less than 3.5 centimeters, no evidence of fetal cardiac activity, a beta HCG less than 5,000, and patients who are compliant and live close to the hospital should receive methotrexate. Methotrexate does not always work and you need the patient to follow up in case a rupture still occurs. A significant percentage of women treated with methotrexate will require a second dose. However, methotrexate treatment does keep many women out of the operating room and up to 60% of these women will achieve a pregnancy in the future. Listed here are contraindications for the use of methotrexate therapy for an ectopic pregnancy. The other management option is surgery. Listed here are indications for choosing surgery as the primary treatment method. There are different surgeries performed for ectopic pregnancy based on the patient's presentation and the surgeon's experience. Most often, an ectopic pregnancy is removed through the laparoscope. The image on this slide is taken through the laparoscope during surgery for a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Notice the blood in the pelvis behind the uterus. The ampulla of the right fallopian tube is dilated from the presence of the ectopic. Because the tube is ruptured and is actively bleeding, it will need to be removed. In this video of a right ovarian pregnancy, the patient's left tube and ovary are normal. The right ovary contains a large mass seen as the ovary is flipped up out of the pelvis. This is the ectopic. Active bleeding can be seen at the inferior aspect of the mass. An opening is made in the ovary, and the pregnancy tissue is pulled from the defect. The ovary is then sutured closed for hemostasis. An ectopic pregnancy is a can't-miss diagnosis that is made via HNP, quantitative beta-HCG, and transvaginal ultrasound. Have a high index of suspicion for any reproductive age woman who presents with abdominal pain and or vaginal bleeding in a positive pregnancy test. Note that the possibility for future pregnancy is the same whether methotrexate or surgery is chosen. Don't forget to give the patient Rogam if she is Rh negative. One more possible etiology for bleeding in early pregnancy is a molar pregnancy. Patients with a molar pregnancy present the same way as previously described for miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy with vaginal bleeding and a positive pregnancy test. You should obtain an HNP and order a beta HCG, transvaginal ultrasound, CBC, and blood type and RH. The ultrasound report will return as molar pregnancy. There are two types of molar pregnancies, partial and complete. Partial moles have fetal tissue present with a molar placenta and are not usually diagnosed until a miscarriage occurs. What you're most likely to see is a complete molar pregnancy. Complete molar pregnancies have no associated fetal tissue. They are comprised completely of an enlarged vesicular placenta that looks like clusters of grapes. In addition to abnormal bleeding in a positive pregnancy test, patients with a complete molar pregnancy may have an enlarged uterus, but no fetal heart sounds will be detected. The quantitative beta-HCG is usually very high, sometimes over a million. This slide compares an ultrasound image of a normal fetus with a normal placenta on the left. The middle image is a fetus with a cystic placenta that represents a partial mole. The image on the right shows only cystic placenta with no fetal tissue. This image is a complete mole, the one you're most likely to encounter. The only acceptable treatment for a molar pregnancy, partial or complete, is surgical evacuation of the pregnancy with a DNC. Molar pregnancies can progress to carcinoma and can be lethal for the patient. She will require follow-up by a gynecologist or oncologist. Don't forget to give Rogam for these patients when indicated. This concludes the presentation on what do I do with this patient who is bleeding with a positive pregnancy test.